Kia ora everybody, welcome to our chat today. I'm Audrey, a Plunkett line nurse for Well for Plunkett Whanau Afina, and I also have Diana Purvis joining us. So Diana is a paediatric dermatologist, which means basically that she is a skin doctor and she currently works at Starship. She is an amazing resource. She has got so much information and sees so many children and babies with a wide range of skin conditions. So we have her here today, um, just thinking, you know, we're coming into winter, we start getting lots of calls on Plunkett Line about all different kinds of um, dry skin, eczema, um, flare-ups coming into winter. So I will just pass you over to Diana and she can introduce herself and we can go from there. Look, look, kia ora everyone. I'm so happy to be here and really excited to be able to talk to lots of people about skin. I think um, skin care is something that people make out to be quite complicated, but actually it is very simple and it doesn't have to be a big burden for families. I know how busy people are when they've got new babies and what a juggle it is, particularly if you've got older kids as well and toddlers running around <laughs> when you're trying to bath the baby, you're really hard. Um, but I, I think it's really important that um, just any family can do well in terms of caring for their child's skin. And it doesn't have, you don't need to have a lot of expensive fancy products to look after your child's skin well. Um, when babies are first born, when they're a newborn, you'll see when they're born, they've got that lovely cheesy stuff on their skin. That's called vernix. And that's like nature's moisturizer from inside the womb. And so when babies are born, they kind of got this waterproofing layer on them. And that stays on them for the first week. And so we don't like to bath babies too much. And certainly don't like to use soaps and detergents when they're young because they have this natural skin barrier, which is really helpful and useful for them. So if, if when you're bathing babies when they're very young, they really just need water. Just a little bit of water to wash off, um, you know, any poos and wheeze and <laughs> milk <laughs> and all that sort of stuff you know just a gentle wash and 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 babies just need very gentle care so you don't need to use flannels and harsh things just you can do it just very gently with your own hand um and the most important thing I always say with bathing a baby is don't let their head go under the water <laughs> keep it very simple and just not too long just a few minutes but the babies love going in the bath and so I think that is a really important part of a routine and a baby a, a baby's routine is to have a bath and bathing once a day does seem to be very helpful at keeping the skin healthy and um, reducing the risk of getting infections as well but no soap because the soap is um, um drying and often can be a bit irritating but just bathing once a day with simple water is enough for most babies when would you um we often get this question by you know callers or our uh, parents out in the community when what sort of age would you recommend that you start that once a day bath or how long would you wait after birth to bath your baby yeah, so, so they they recommend that um I, I don't think there's any fixed rules on this and there's not a lot of research. So it's all it's all based on what people's experience is. But when babies are first born, we you know, in their first day, they do need to be wiped down at least with a towel to get off a lot of um the 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 products from the delivery. Yeah. Um but then after that, um you don't necessarily need to bath them every day in the first week because they're quite they're still quite have a lot of trouble with their temperature regulation. Yeah. Um, but once they get to sort of two or three weeks, most people will be bathing every couple of days. And when you get to more like two, three months of age, every day can, is fine. And it's a nice, that often it's a thing that um, another person in the family does rather than the mum, because the mum's doing yes. everything else. Yes. Not the dad or the granny that does the bath. Yes. And it can be a really special, special time for them to do that. Yeah, that's such a nice job to pass on to somebody else and yeah. have that bond in time <laughs> and give the mum a wee bit of a break. Um, I should have said at the beginning, for everybody that's watching and listening today, feel free to ask questions and we can answer those as we go as well. Um, and just going back, Diana, to what you said with no soap. So is there a recommended age where they could have some soap in the bath or is that just not necessary for the you know, first six months or year? Yeah, um, look, if you ask dermatologists, we don't recommend soap for anyone. Okay. 
great. And yeah, that's awesome information. You've got quite a sensitive skin. So yeah. um, most of the, anything that foams and bubbles works by lifting the layers of oils off your skin. And so if you're, if you're dirty, like you've got mud or, or grass or those sorts of or oil stains, yes, you might need some soap to wash that off but if you are just if you've just been doing a normal daily life hanging out around the house or whatever a rinse off is often enough and okay. if you are going to use a cleanser there's actually a lot of soap free washes which you can use now and they're available at the supermarket some people even use a moisturizer instead of a soap so people use um, prescription moisturizers like sorbaline or non-ionic cream or cetamacrogol with glycerol, the ones in the pumps, they often use those instead of a soap for, for washing because it doesn't strip the oils so much from the skin. Okay, mm. that's, yeah, that's really good information. Thank you. We've actually just had someone ask, um, my daughter's face is red, dry and flaky. Is sorbaline cream okay to use? So would that be a good time to use the sorbaline Cream. Yeah, I think dry, dry, red, and flaky usually means that that the skin is a bit irritated, and there's a whole lot of reasons that can be the case. Um, but sorbaline or any of the other prescription moisturisers are generally designed to be uh, quite low in perfumes and fragrances, which are products which can often irritate babies. Yeah, and and are generally. Um, usually are tolerated well I, I can't guarantee any particular individual moisturizer will suit everybody but yeah. sorbaline one is very popular and i would say that's the one most of my patients tolerate really well and it's one that you can get free on prescription um okay. so it's it's one that's easily available for families as well okay and is that just a prescription through your gp or they need to see a dermatologist no, a GP or a, a, a nurse, a prescribing nurse can, can do that. So it's really easy to get hold of. You okay. can buy it over the counter as well if you want to, but it's yep. free on prescription. Yeah, no, that's great. Awesome. We've had another question, Diana. Um, oh, sorry. Should we have to use shampoo for newborn to two months old? I'd... I'd, I'd I don't recommend it usually. Um, I certainly didn't use shampoo on my kids till they're about three or four years old. Yes. <laughs> Depends what they get in their hair, of course. I mean, there's yeah. times when you need it if they've got food in there. <laughs> yeah. But um, actually, a lot of sh shampoo is, is another detergent. It's foaming. And it's often quite, can be quite irritating. Sometimes I do use uh, shampoo for infants who have quite a bit of cradle cap. And okay. so cradle cap is um, where you get thick, greasy scales forming on the scalp. And that's quite common, quite normal thing for babies to have. Sometimes can be a bit irritating for the babies, but often it doesn't bother them at yep. all. Um, but a little bit of a massage with the shampoo can be quite helpful. But the shampoo, if you get it over the, the rest of the baby, can be a bit drying for I mean, I see a lot of babies with quite sensitive skin and they don't tolerate shampoo very well. So I often, if you're going to shampoo, I would say once once a week, maybe okay. twice a week maximum. Um, and I would suggest wrapping the baby in a towel and holding them and just holding their head over the, the basin or the or the tub so that you're when you're rinsing off the shampoo, it's not going over the body of the baby. And that way you've also got good control of their head. Um, so you can do it so that you're not getting lots of shampoo in their eyes. <laughs> yeah, that sounds perfect. That's a great Which technique. Which is really unpopular. <laughs> yeah. That will definitely result in a crying baby. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've got a two and a half year old and we have shampooed her maybe once or twice due to Play-Doh or food. But otherwise we don't tend to shampoo. And yeah. she's got long, long hair as well. So... We've managed to get away with that for a couple of years. Yeah, that's good. I mean, the longer you can get away without using a lot of products, the better. Yeah. I think less is more. Perfect. Mm. Awesome. Okay. And we have another question. Thanks, everybody, for these questions. They're great. Would you advise not to use aqueous cream as a soap substitute for babies with eczema? Oh, that's an interesting question. So um, I don't know. Aqueous cream is one of a number of funded um, emollient products which you can get so there's sorbaline aqueous cream non-ionic cream emulsifying one 
Aqueous cream is designed that, so that you can use it as a as a soap substitute. Um, and I yes, yes, it's fine to use as that. This, we used to have problems with aqueous cream about five, 10 years ago with an, an ingredient in it, but that's no longer in aqueous. So it's fine to use aqueous cream. Um, I tend to try and keep things simple for people. So I tend to use whatever they're using as their moisturizer, as their soap okay. substitute. And yep. I tend to prefer Sorbaline as a moisturizer because it's in a pump, which means yep. it's easy to keep clean and you're not, you're not having tubs of things open, which then the toddler puts their hands in or that gets tipped on the floor, you put gets dirt in it. So I find the pumps much simpler to use, but there's absolutely no problem with using aqueous cream if that's what you prefer. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, and while we're talking about eczema, I just thought I might, I might ask because um, this is a little bit of a, we get this question quite a lot as well. How can you tell the difference if your child or baby has just dry skin or if they have eczema? What would be the difference? Ah, that's a really good question because there's quite a lot of conditions that get mistaken for being eczema when yep. they're not. Um, the key diagnostic feature for something being eczema is that it's itchy. Okay. okay. If yep. your child is not itchy, they don't have eczema. Okay. Um, and people say, but I won't know if my my baby's only six weeks old. How will they they how will they show that they're itchy? If your child is itchy, you will know. It will be very obvious to you as a parent that they're itchy. So they'll lie on their back and they'll rub, they'll lie on the ground and they'll rub their back on the thing, or they'll rub their face against you when you're holding them to scratch their face. And or when you're changing their nappies, they'll reach their hands down and they'll grab at their legs. Um, so they won't be like you and I would be very localized and where we itch, but they, that you it will be very obvious to you as a parent if your child is itchy. And so mm. dry skin can look similar because you'll get that sort of slightly rough feeling and it might look a little bit uh, discolored, so either paler or redder. Yeah. And, but it won't bother the baby t at all. And in those okay. instances, I would tend to just manage it with a moisturizer. Whereas okay. if they're itchy, then they may well need a steroid cream. Okay, so we have just got another um, question talking about eczema. My baby is going to be six months and had has has had eczema since two and a half months. Her eczema is a bit controlled now, but she's very itchy. We literally have to hold her twenty four seven to stop her scratching her face and legs and everywhere. That sounds like a really tough situation that you're in. Um, yeah. Diana, would you have any advice for it, it is a tough situation look, under control? It is tough. She's. This is not the only family that's in this tough situation. There's lots of people who have to deal with this. And it's really upsetting to see your baby uncomfortable and scratching. Um, I think um, when the babies are itchy, then they do need medicated creams to manage their eczema. And um, steroid, there's a range of different steroid creams. And it will really depend on what your practitioner sees when they examine you and what you've used and how it's worked. Um, but I generally uh, think that it's the really important thing for the family to understand is that um, steroid creams are quite safe to use in babies. They've been studied a lot. They've been used for very long periods of time. And we know how to use them safely and well. Um, and so please don't be afraid to use steroid cream on your baby if they have eczema. Um, we know that there's there's more and more information coming through that suggests that if we manage eczema very well, we make a big difference to the long-term outcome of the baby in terms not just of eczema, but also risks of other allergic diseases such as food allergies and asthma. And so they're actually doing studies at the moment looking at treating babies with eczema really proactively to make sure they have no eczema to see if that will reduce their risk of um, later allergic diseases. And the, the provisional data they have coming through suggests it is really helpful. So I think it is worth managing babies eczema actively. The steroid creams um, uh, should be put on, I tend to use them once a day um after the bath is a good time to put them on but the moisturizer will help your baby feel more comfortable and you can put that on lots and lots of times a day so a lot of people will put moisturizer on every time they change nappy um okay. 
But the steroid cream needs to go on all of the eczema, not just the very worst bits. And so I do often find people are just putting it on the, the very worst bit, but ignoring all the, the other stuff. But they actually need to put it on all of it. And so okay. I would suggest if your baby's suffering like that, that it is worth going back to your family doctor or their practice nurse to get them to assess the baby, make sure that what you're doing is right. Um, and if, if it's still a difficulty, and particularly if it's having a big impact on how the baby's sleeping or growing, then it is something that is referred through sometimes to paediatric services as well. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. We have, um, we tend to recommend daily baths, you know, mm. for babies with eczema, uh, warm. We've just got a question coming through. So can bathing irritate eczema further? So our recommendation um, through Plunkett and Plunkett line is daily baths. Um, mm. And we get the information as well from the kidshealth.org.nz yeah. website. Would you, do you, um, would you recommend the same, Diana, daily baths? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. there's actually, uh, having a bath daily helps a lot with eczema. Okay. And so it doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be a long bath, just, you know, five, ten minutes is, is yep. plenty. And um, you don't have to fill the bath right up to the rim either. I know even yep. with water costs money now. Yes, <laughs> yeah. But um, and it doesn't have to be a big bath or a long bath, but just actually rinsing the skin, particularly if you do have a child with eczema where they've had a lot of creams put on, rinsing those off and, and having a fresh base to put new products on is really important. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it's great. Um, and can we put hydrocortisone one percent on the scalp? We've got a listener saying her two and a half year old has got it everywhere. Is that oh, okay on the scalp? It is fine on the scalp, but it's really hard to put creams through the hair. Yeah. <laughs> so, so unless your child is relatively bald, <laughs> it's really difficult to put a cream on their scalp. So please, it might be worth going back to your doctor because there are some specific scalp preparations that they can use. It should be a little bit easier to put on. 1% hydrocortisone, though, would be very safe to use. Might not be strong enough, actually, in a two-year-old, but um, it would be a good starting point. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. For those of you as well, just tuning in, I have, um, I'm have i Audrey, one of the whanau fina Plunkett nurses on Plunkett line. And we have Diana, who is a skin and um, expert dermatologist for children. Um, we've just covered a few things already, including, um, I've because I've just got a question saying, my one-year-old has eczema. We've tried a lot of moisturizer and steroid cream, but nothing works permanently. I don't want steroid to use steroids on my little bubba. Is there a solution? And we've just had a great chat with Diana saying um, that there have been has been research and extensive testing about the use of steroid creams and um, on little on our little people, and that it is safe and it is necessary to use when your baby has eczema. So I just thought I would just recover that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just having a wee flick through to make sure that we're answering the questions for you all. Okay, so Diana, is it safe to pour a wee bit of oil in the water for a baby's bath? And what would you advise for thick cradle cap, please? Okay, so um, oils in the bath are quite popular. Um, they probably don't make a big difference in terms of eczema. But some people like them because of um, the moisturising property. They feel it makes the, the baby skin more moist. Um, in terms of oils, they're not all equal. Olive oil can be a little bit irritating, actually, okay. if it's on the skin. So um, generally, if people are choosing to use an oil in the bath, I'd suggest coconut oil. It's usually right. suitable. It doesn't seem to cause many problems. It's been used in tra traditional practices around the world for a long time, and I've never seen a patient have a problem with it, so I'm kind of comfortable with coconut oil. But with olive oil, we do see it, it irritates, actually. Um, the main issue I would have with oil in the bath is as the baby gets older, it makes it quite slippery, and so yes. they can slip over. Yeah. <laughs> They but is the coconut oil them. also good for cradle cap as well? Um, yeah, so oils tradition. In fact, olive oil is used a lot for cradle cap. And part of part of why olive oil can be helpful for cradle cap is that it is a bit irritating, and so it helps to break down the thick scales that you get yep. with, with cradle cap. Um, I think the important things with 
cradle cap is is just massaging because that yep. sort of loosens the scales and it doesn't matter which oil you use um i would often use a suggest a coconut oil and and also just gently combing it is helpful to lift the Perfect. scale but you don't need to get rid of every single little bit because if you're starting to get to, to really scraping off the last bits you're actually damaging and irritating the child's scalp and you'll get more scale form in response to that uh, okay that, yep. seven, uh, cradle cap is is related to dandruff that we get when we're older Oh. And um, sometimes it can be helpful to use an anti-dandruff shampoo. Okay, um, if that but, was quite a thick cradle cap. Yeah, but if it's quite thick, but th a little bit of that will help just to, to soften and lift it off. Yeah. So so a little bit of that can help. But again, I would make sure that you're just using it just on the scalp, not on the whole baby. Yep. Lift it off and not too often. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, this, we've got a great question come through. Would a baby grow out of eczema or is this oh, a lifelong sort of, you know, concern? That's, that's, that a, really, that's a really good question. <laughs> I like really that one. <laughs> so, so I think it's helpful to understand what the problem is in the skin when you have eczema. And I'll often talk to my patients about this because I think um, eczema is something you manage as a family day by day. So it's really important you understand what you're dealing with. So eczema is one of the key problems in eczema is a problem with the outermost layer of the skin. So the, the top layer of the skin is called the stratum corneum and it's made up of layers of cells, which you can Oh no, have we lost her? Sorry, I cut out there. In, in between the, the bricks, there's this lovely lipid rich substance. So if you've got a really healthy skin, your, your skin is soft and supple and it can do anything and it's really strong. People who have eczema genetically usually... Oh no. you still hear me to make the bricks uh, yeah. the right shape and to make the, the 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 lipids in between so they instead of having a strong wall like this they start off with a wall with gaps in it so they've got a sensitive skin and that sensitive skin is something that they're going to carry with them their whole life and they're going to need to be more careful with how they care for their skin so that will be the avoiding soaps and bubble baths and maybe needing a bit more moisturizer and just being a little bit careful about what products you're using. So trying to keep things very simple, um, not using too much perfume and fragrance and, 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 and products that you're putting on the skin. In terms of what's going to happen to a baby with eczema, there's a, there's a number of different trajectories that people follow through their life. There's quite a lot of infants who have, typically babies get eczema around three months of age sometimes as early as six weeks but not usually earlier than that and then there's a whole lot of babies who have really dreadful eczema in that first year of life and um, have it all over and we need to treat quite regularly to manage it but if we manage it well and get the skin controlled often by the time we're getting to 12 15 months of age it's really starting to calm down and a lot of babies will sort of move into sort of I don't like to say they grow out of it. I tend to think they've gone into remission. <laughs> so it sort of settles down so that you're mainly just dealing with just maybe a little bit of sensitive skin care rather than using a lot of medicated products. Um, but there are some people who continue to have eczema. And as you get older, it, it becomes a little bit more, usually becomes a little bit more localised. So it'll be just around your joints, your elbows yeah. and your knees and your ankles, quite common areas in kids. And, and that will wax and wane a bit. But... People used, always used to say that kids always grow out of eczema, but we know for a fact that, that that's not true. And actually the majority of people continue to have a little bit of problems with their skin. Even if they have a period of remission for, for 10, 15 years, they might get eczema come back when they're an adult, when they're a mum, mm. when they're washing their hands all the time, they'll get a bit of hand yes. yep. or other things like that. So I think... Um, I think it's something that continues to be need to be, have a little bit of management, really. 
Yeah. Okay. Is there anything that, um, like as parents, we can do in when your baby's in utero or in those early few weeks to help prevent eczema in your child? Yeah, that would be great. Um, there are some <laughs> things that we we hoped would be helpful but haven't shown to be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, we know that when you're pregnant, um, and when you're breastfeeding, that what what you eat doesn't make a difference to your child's risk of eczema. So we would encourage you to eat a broad, healthy diet. You don't need to exclude certain foods while you're um, okay. uh, pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, we thought for a while that if we moisturize babies from birth, that would help stop them get eczema. But mm. when we've done bigger studies, it hasn't shown to be the case, unfortunately. Okay. Um, there's a bit of... Um, not very strong, but there's possible uh, some suggestion that taking probiotics while you're pregnant and breastfeeding may help to protect against eczema. Okay. And so some some parents choose to take eczema probiotics, yeah. um, but it's uh, the 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 effect of that's quite small and it's yeah. not very certain, and so it's not a strong enough finding for us to make that as a recommendation for everybody. Okay. Um, but it's a pretty safe thing to do. And so if yeah. you, you want to take a probiotic and you can afford it, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. And is there any links to eczema and what food um, the children are eating? Ah, that's a really complex relationship. Sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> I think um, in a way the whole the whole thinking of eczema and food has really turned on its head in the last 10 to 15 years. So we now understand that actually having eczema predisposes people to having food allergies. Okay. Rather than the other way around. Yeah. And so babies who have um, uh, trouble with their skin with eczema, we think that part of the way they might become um, allergic to foods is that instead of meeting food by eating it which is how we design we design to to our immune system is designed to to tolerate food because we eat it and we've got a very special immune system in our gut and so if we introduce foods our immune system realizes it's a foreign body but it accepts it and it, it tolerates it if you have broken skin with eczema so your skin barrier is not working as well you've got a more sensitive skin the, for some of the times the food protein may get presented to the immune system through the skin rather than by eating it. And we think that might trigger an abnormal mm -hmm. reaction to the food, so cause an allergic reaction, so anaphylaxis or hives or those sorts of reactions. And so they've done studies looking at can we help to prevent food allergies by making sure that babies are eating foods when they're younger. Um, before okay. they've had trouble with their skin. And that has been shown to be really helpful at protecting against food allergies. Okay, and that's so, so interesting. And so now the recommendations are is that we should be trying to introduce all foods to babies, not foods they're going to choke on, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but it's okay to introduce dairy and nuts and egg and all of these foods to babies when they're younger. The younger you introduce yep. them to the baby, the less likely it is the baby will have an allergic reaction to them. If you wait till they're over one and you introduce these foods, the rates of allergy is much higher. So we like, um, so now the, the recommendations are that when you start introducing solids, you should include foods like dairy and egg and wheat, all those things into the diet as part of a normal weaning program. And yep. Ideally, while you're still breastfeeding a bit as well, if you are able to breastfeed, because um, that seems to be helpful and protective against allergy as well. So we would awesome. encourage both and then keep them in the diet regularly. Yep. I know a lot of people whose children have eczema, um, they get told by people in the supermarket, stop giving your child dairy or stop doing this. Or they sometimes they notice themselves they think oh my child's eczema's worse today what did they eat yesterday i'm worried it might have been that new food that we started that's made their eczema worse and um and so people naturally are um worried and are wanting to try and make their child better by stopping foods but but in truth that 
doesn't tend to be helpful. And in fact, it's really unusual for us to get a significant improvement of particularly of bad eczema by taking food out. And so I do a lot of clinics with the pediatric allergy team at Starship. And we spend a lot of time trying to keep the diet as normal as possible. Okay. The exception to that is if you have an immediate hypersensitive reaction, which is not eczema. It's a reaction that usually happens within 20 to 20 minutes to 30 minutes after having a new food. And often the babies will vomit or they may get hives or, or welts on their on their face or the or body or really bad itching really quickly after they're eating it. Um, or they can be very more severely affected, have breathing issues. And so those reactions are slightly different to, an, to having eczema two days later. That's a different reaction. So if you have an immediate reaction, that's something that does need to be assessed separately and managed separately to managing eczema. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But in, it is, there is a correlation between eczema and intoler a bit more of an intolerance. Yes, yeah, so, so children who have yeah. eczema are more likely to have food allergies yeah. than children who don't have eczema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But and when taking you said, the, oh, taking the food out doesn't fix the eczema. Yeah, no, that <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When you said bad eczema, do you mean like a flare up? Um, so, but, but when I talk about, I guess, um, if you have more widespread eczema, so you have more inflamed skin over much of your body, it, so some pe people notice that, that, that ch eczema changes in severity day by day, so people will see one day that their, their child's eczema seems to be okay, and the next day, for yeah. no reason that they can put their finger on, it will be much worse everywhere, and so it will be more widespread and more itchy and uncomfortable. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Awesome. Thank you, Diana. Um, we have got another question. How is itchio is it sorry, I'm itch itchiosis different to eczema and are there different is there a different advice to manage it? Ah, I, I think they mean that that completely wrong. Probably. That's probably yeah, that yeah, probably so it. the ichthyosis is different to eczema. Ichthyosis is a genetic condition that causes the skin to be more dry and flaky and there's a quite a range of different types of ichthyosis that people can have um, but it's it's something that's genetically programmed in the skin and it's something that doesn't respond to steroid creams because it's not an inflammation so it's a dry skin condition so we usually manage it with moisturizers um, there are some forms of ichthyosis where you can also get eczema as well so sometimes people have both, but ichthyosis itself doesn't respond to eczema treatments. So it doesn't okay. need to be treated with steroids. It just needs to be treated with moisturizers. Great. Wonderful. I hope that's cleared that up for the person that is watching today. Um, have you got anything else that you would like to cover, Diana, before we wrap this up? Well, I noticed there's a question about washing powder. Oh, sorry, um, I missed that one. Which I, which I, I just want to talk because, about quickly because we have been having a. Normally, with washing powders, it doesn't matter too much what you use. Um, I would tend to suggest something that's on special is quite good. Uh, <laughs> the sensitive ones possibly are a little bit more gentle, but it, it usually doesn't matter. However, in the last couple of years, New Zealand dermatologists have been noticing a whole lot of people having reactions to some laundry additives and these um, cause rashes usually around the neck or in the armpits or in the groin or sometimes even under the nappy and it's that there's an ingredient in these laundry additives which is an antiseptic that people get reactions to and so there's a couple of laundry products which are called canistan or detol laundry additives which can cause this reaction we don't think they're necessary for good skin care for you to add them into to your child's washing. So we would prefer that you just use a simple uh, a standard washing liquid or washing powder for washing your clothes. Awesome. Yeah, yeah that's really good to know. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. I completely missed that question. <laughs> oh, and we've got another one. Can you please explain Moloscum? Molluscum, well, this is a totally different question. So Molluscum, <laughs> <laughs> Molluscum is, is a virus. So it's a, vi it's, a, it's a viral infection of the skin. And it's, it's very common, but it's really variable how badly it affects kids. So it causes little pearly little lumps on the skin. Um, 
my daughter called them bubble warts when she had oh, them. Yes. They like little bubbles on the skin. Yeah. And some people just get two or three. Some people get 20 or 30. And some people seem to have like 200 of them. Okay. Yeah. And they, they're really frustrating. They tend to hang around for some months, sometimes even as long as a couple of years. And then they go away when the body's immune system gets rid of them. But they feel quite frustrating. They look, they don't look the most beautiful and they often get a bit of eczema with them. So they can be annoying. Mm. Um, there's been a bit of uh, research looking at various treatments for them, but nothing is particularly good at treating them, unfortunately. Okay. And so I usually advise people to um, manage them by trying to prevent uh, infections. Because sometimes if you get inflammation with them, you can get a boil or skin infection and so um, I often will suggest dilute bleach baths or use of an antiseptic cream such as uh, Christoderm um, if there's infection but the the, the molluscum itself um, there's no good excellent treatment for them other than time. Okay and you've just mentioned bleach baths have you got oh. um, we've just got another question that I missed as well sorry everybody okay. any recommendation on bleach baths so potentially like how to yeah. do one how often so so how to do one well i you'd have to, i would suggest you go to i think the kids the kids health yeah. page should have uh, instructions on bleach baths yeah. there um uh, certainly yes I, i'm sure they do actually um, yeah they've got some great little videos so they're just about yeah, three minutes yeah, long so, so that's kidshealth.org.nz yeah and so in the extra section, there's instructions on bleach baths. You, it's important to use a plain bleach that's not lemon scented or anything like that. And you need to do a dilution that's correct. So you, that's why you need to look at the instructions to get the right amount of bleach for the amount of water. Bleach baths, um, they do seem to be a little bit helpful in um, reducing skin infection. And they, they also seem to have a benefit in making eczema a little bit easier to manage. And so I would suggest them twice a week for children with eczema. Um, I don't tend to use them very often under the age of one unless somebody, unless the baby has had trouble with skin infections. Um, but over one, it's a little bit like being in a chlorinated swimming pool. So it's it's pretty it's safe and you can put more than one kid in the same bleach bath it's fine um awesome. but just a couple of times a week and probably the important thing is that don't store your bleach in the bathroom you have to have it out of reach of the kids um yep. because it, it needs to be kept up high or in a, in a um, cleaning cupboard mm. absolutely that's such great advice thank you so much diana for joining us today and thank you to everybody for tuning in listening asking all of those wonderful questions I'm so sorry if we didn't answer them all, um, but as mentioned before, there's a great resource on kidshealth.org.nz. They cover so much about eczema, um, dry skin, and hopefully if we haven't been able to answer your questions today, you can find what you're looking for on there. Otherwise, of course, you can always chat to your Plunkett nurse or give us a call on at Plunkett Line. Um, so just to do a re recap for a wee recap for everybody um, in case you missed the beginning. Um, so just to go over what Diana said, basically with our baby skincare, keep it very minimal, very simple. Water is best. Avoid soap pretty much forever, but for as long as you can. So if it's bubbly and frothy, avoid it. Um, we can use other solutions such as sorbeline or aqueous cream when needed. The biggest difference between eczema and dry skin, so if you're wondering if your wee one might have eczema, is that it's itchy. So eczema will always be itchy, whereas dry skin can still be a bit red and flaky, but it doesn't have the itch that comes with that. Um, Diana, you've covered so much today. Thank you so much for joining us. Sorry if I've missed any other key points. But yeah, today has been absolutely great. And to everybody watching and listening, this chat will be available on Facebook after it's finished. And we will also put a couple of resources um, underneath the video so that you can access those links yourself from home. Great. Thank you very much, Diana. My pleasure.